Um, our next presenter is, uh, I actually have the pleasure of working with when I worked over at Texas Department of Agriculture, uh, Mrs. Paige Abernathy. She is the nutrition specialist at TDA until November 8th, which will be her last day, um, resigning. But the work that she did at TDA um, was absolutely incredible. Um, in, her, in her role, she supports First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative by leading efforts to train and support schools in the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. I have to say the work that Paige has done across the state in training schools um, has really led to some incredible incredible results. Um, I'm very excited to hear what she is going to present today. So it's not easy to follow that presentation with the TDA presentation, but it's going to be really interesting, I can assure you. No, but as Lisa said, um, I am uh, making my transition out of TDA. I just had a little baby boy, and so I'm going to go spend some time with him, um, but I'm definitely going to miss what I do at TDA because I think it is so important, and I actually am quite passionate about it, but I'm also very passionate that I'm never going to drive a minivan, so <laughs> I mean, the marketing maybe had something to do with that, but I'm not doing it. Even with the baby, I will, I will SUV my way around Austin. How about a sedan? Oh, sedan. I mean, doesn't that even sound like a mom? I don't know if I can do it. You can get fuel-efficient SUVs, right? <laughs> it's not, am I doing it? This one? It's making the noise like it's doing something. But, oh, now we're probably competing. Okay, so this is a lot of information, and I don't know exactly who all is in the audience. I'm hoping that it's not too repetitive, redundant, that's stuff that you guys all know about. I know there are some people from Child Nutrition here, and this is going to be stuff that you know for sure. Um, so I won't try to kill you with information. Um, I think you all know towards the end of the day there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask us questions. So if I breeze over something and you actually are interested in it, feel free to ask. Um, come up to me at that. I guess it's towards the end of the day or after this, I guess. I have a few extra minutes, actually, at the end for questions. Yeah, perfect. So I'm uh, definitely going to... Uh, focus a little, mostly on the National School Lunch Program. I think that's mostly why we're all here. Um, talk a little bit about the program guidelines. We're going to talk about the future of, you know, some changes that are coming to school nutrition. So I think it's helpful for you to have at least some baseline of where we're at now so you can appreciate where we're going. Um, some of the initiatives that um, USDA has right now in schools, we'll talk a little bit about that. Nutrigram, and then just how we can get involved in school nutrition. So that's a lot, but I think we can get through it. There we go. Okay. So Texas Department of Agriculture, what we do is ad administer USDA's child nutrition programs. So again, focusing more today on the National School Lunch Program, but we do a lot of other programs, and I just thought it would be worth mentioning in the event you had questions about other programs. Um, the National School Lunch, School Breakfast, of course, we do, After School Snack Program, Summer Food Service Program, that's something that we're really trying to ramp up. We know it's a good way to reach a lot of people who need um, healthy, nutritious meals. We know that they need them during the school year. Of course, when school is out, they're still going to need that healthy, nutritious food. So we're trying to make uh, the school nutrition program where, where kids will, can go. Um, USDA Foods, that's the new name for commodity foods. Um, lots of changes going on with commodity foods. They are getting a lot more healthy. Um, if you have questions about that, too, we can talk about it. But um, Mainly, just good to know that these are in schools, um, as you are, as is well known, uh, they're incented to use commodity foods because they're affordable, and it's good to know that these foods are now whole grains, they're lowering saturated fat, lowering sodium, um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing at all, it's actually a good thing. Um, TDA also does the child care program, so just like there are nutrition standards in schools for school meals, for those on the child and adult food care program, uh, they also have nutrition standards, and this is something that we are uh, constantly working. We know that kids don't just start eating when they enter school in kindergarten, right? They, you know, they want, we want to reach them as young as possible. So there's some great work going on in that program. Um, not something we'll spend a whole lot of time on, but if you have questions, again, let me know. And we can talk about it. Special milk program, uh, commodity supplemental food program, and the fresh fruit and vegetable program, again, 
other programs that you may have heard of uh, may be going on in your school, and if you have questions about it, certainly something that we can talk about. So regardless of what child nutrition program we're talking about, the goal is right here. Of course, to serve nutritionally adequate meals to students. Obviously, that's something that we really want to do, um, but we also have are charged with helping students connect you know, what they eat with how, to how they feel. You know, why is it important for me to eat my fruits and vegetables? We keep telling them they need to do it, but why? And so part of what we do at the Texas Tar Department of Agriculture is educate. Um, and that's uh, some of the stuff that we'll talk about how exactly we're doing that now. Um, <coughs> ultimate goal to impact hunger and obesity, because it's kind of a strange counterintuitive thing that a child can be obese, but not well nourished. I think we probably all know that too. Um, but really trying to connect that and uh, help the kids who really need it most. <laughs> Child nutrition programs can have a huge impact. I think we've talked a little bit about the marketing influences that these kids are faced with. Um, home, I mean, they, there's a it's multifaceted. The issue is certainly not just going to be easily solved, otherwise it probably already would have been. Um, but there's no doubt that child nutrition programs in school can have a huge impact. And um, the Department of Agriculture really does take that seriously. They see it as a responsibility and obligation to do something for our students. And that's what I think is going on in schools right now are some big changes to do that. And these are just some uh, participation rates so you can get an idea of the number of meals in Texas that are actually being served right now. And um, you can see we're not reaching as many students at breakfast as we are at lunch. Um, certainly working to increase that because that, of course, is a very important meal. And, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, there could be multiple reasons why children aren't participating in the breakfast program. They, that may be a meal that they eat at home with their family, and certainly nothing wrong with that. But um, if there is students that are missing breakfast completely, you know, school nutrition can or the school meal can be a great opportunity. So we're really trying to expand these programs and make sure everybody knows about them. Okay, so school nutrition program guidelines. We'll talk a little bit about that um, just briefly so, again, you guys can see where we're at right now and then appreciate where we're going in the future. Um, any school district that's going to participate in the National School Lunch Program has to serve meals that are in line with these nutrition standards. So, um, as you can see, dietary guidelines for Americans not the most current version. These are the 1995 dietary guidelines, but there are, some, there are nutrition standards for all meals that are served in school right now. 30% um, calories from fat, less than 10 from saturated fat, and then you can see the vitamins and minerals that, are, that they're focusing on with the school nutrition. Now, how schools go about doing this is gonna look a little bit different at each district, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so there's different menu planning approaches. This is a very summarized version. It gets very complicated, um, and I don't know how much everybody needs to understand the details of it, but essentially there's a food-based, a nutrient standard-based, and then a, you can do an alternate menu planning approach if you want to. Nobody in Texas is doing it, but if you can come up with a creative way to meet the nutrition guidelines and USDA will approve it, you can do it. Again, very summarized, but a food-based menu planning would be if you were just to think about, I don't know, your, your standard traditional, my, the pyramid or you know, my plate, I know. Um, but just how you would think about food planning. They look for food components. So there's got to be these items have to be present on, on the tray in order for the meal to be reimbursable. Okay, so that's one way that schools can go about doing it. Um, have to have all items that are listed up here. Another way to do it is a new, what's called nutrient standard, which that just means that as long as they have an entree, milk, and a side dish on the plate, when analyzed using nutrient software, nutrient analysis software, if it meets those stated, previously stated nutrition standards, the meal can meet. So they, depending on what your school district's doing, your meals can actually look quite different and still be meeting those nutrition standards. So if you're curious, you know, about how your school is going about doing it, this would be something to ask. Or if you're hearing, you know, what your kids are eating and you don't understand how on earth that could be, you know, a meal that would be served to your, your child, if it doesn't make sense, this may be how you get your answer, is to better understand what menu planning system your school district is using. And give you a little bit more background and help you to understand maybe your, you know, student isn't taking everything. 
And this leads, of course, to offer versus serve, which is something that is another part of our program. The students, as they go through the line, are not required to take every single item. This is a good thing. It helps reduce waste. As kids come through, they're more empowered if they can go through the line and have, you know, they're invested. They get to select what they want. They're going to be more likely to eat it. Um, but, of course, that also gives them the opportunity to not take some of the healthier items that we would hope that they maybe should. Um, so that is also another reason why you may hear of students' lunches seeming smaller than what you think they should, or it just doesn't seem right that there would be so few items. It, there are, they are being offered all of the items that we've talked about, but they don't necessarily have to take it under the current guidelines. Um, again, good and bad can come from that. And that's also another reason why it's so important for the education component to be there. So the students understand why they're supposed to be picking this stuff up, why they would even want to pick this stuff up. I think we've talked a little bit already about the Texas Public School Nutrition Policy. You, just show of hands, did you guys know that there was a school nutrition policy in Texas? Okay, the, you know, depending on the audience, I suppose. Um, so yeah, we've had this policy. It's been in place for a few years now. 09-10 was the final year of the rollout. So there hasn't been any changes to the policy um, at, at, you know, in a, a year now. Um, the big thing, I think, towards the end was in high schools, they couldn't have any form of candy or any sodas. And um, big deal at the time, I think, as kids are coming through the system, if that's all they ever knew, they don't question it as much which, you know, I guess that's just something powerful for us to think about the importance of reaching kids when they're young because if that's all they know, they don't, just like you were talking about with your child. If they've never been exposed to the, or never had access to soda, you wouldn't expect it to be there. It is hard when they've had access to soda forever and then all of a sudden it's not there. They get a little angry. Or if they've always eaten white pasta and then all of a sudden it's whole grain pasta, there's a difference. I mean, there's no two ways about it. So we, it's really important that we are trying to reach our kiddos at a younger age so they're, they're expecting of it and they accept it a little bit better um, when it is presented to them on the line. So there's guidelines in the policy um, for fat. We know we can't do uh, fried, you can't deep fry foods in school uh, as a, meal, a way of meal preparation. No foods of minimal nutritional value, um, not anything new there. Um, all forms of candy are not allowed to be in school. Um, fruits and vegetables are promoted. They should be on all points of service. And um, there are portion standards set for the, for the snack type items, I guess, that would be served a la carte um, in schools. So there are some standards set on the, food, the meals outside of the reimbursable meal. So that's something worth explaining. Currently with the... Um, the way the, the rules are set up now, USDA doesn't have authority to go in and tell schools what they can serve beyond that reimbursable meal. So that, that was the reason why this policy was put into place, was to sort of rein in what was going on outside of that reimbursable meal. They had, you had your hot meal, but then there was anything and everything was being served and made available through vending machines, that type of stuff. Um, and so Texas was one of the first states to come in and say, okay, we're gonna try to put some you know, restrictions on this and make sure that it's not so out of control. Um, I'm sure since over the past few years, since this has been rolled out, there are lots of new products that come on the market all the time that kind of fit into the gray areas of the policy, um, which make it very challenging to keep the junkier type foods out of school. Um, prime examples are when we say that they can't have any more candy in school. Great, you feel really good about that, right? Well then, there's a new, it's not a candy bar, it's a cookie bar. Well, that's a baked item. So now, well, that can go in schools, right? And, you know, saying, I mean, there's just constantly new products coming on the market, which makes something like having a state policy very challenging because it doesn't happen quickly. And that's why it's so important to be able to have the control at a local level to make decisions like we're not gonna have cookie bars, candy bars, we're not going to do any of that, right? And so um, it's really important to kind of keep that in mind because the marketing is so powerful and they're so quick. I mean, they can respond to demands and create these new products, it, it seems rapidly, you know. So um, we do have a policy in place, but of course, you know, it's something that will continue to be a, a challenge for schools. Um, and this is just a screenshot of our website. If you wanted to see the Texas Public School Nutrition Policy, you're wondering a little bit more about it. What exactly does it say? 
um, you can go to our squaremeals.org website, and on there you can see um, there's a link right to the code, and you, will, you can kind of walk you through the policy if you're curious. <coughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> Not a dry read at all. You can just spend all day reading it. Okay, so we have um, all of these policies and all these regulations in place. Are they enforced? Does anybody actually go in and check? Yes, uh, we do have to go in and uh, measure whether or not schools are following the policies as they're designed to. They have two types of reviews that go on, the coordinator review and the school meals initiative. Um, one of them is looking more at uh, like the paperwork side of things. Are we counting things cor correctly or is, you know, just administratively? Is it everything being done according to program guidelines? And then the school meal initiative looks more at the nutrition side. Are, are the meals meeting the nutrition standards? But they also look at other measures such as quality. I mean, on the line, does the food look the way that it should look? Is it appealing? Um, and this is a great opportunity for us to provide technical assistance to schools to kind of get them to think a little bit um, you know, about things like, what does the food look like? Would you eat it? You know, what could we do to make this look a little bit more appealing? Um, and so both of those do take place. Um, currently, it's once every five years, uh, but they're moving to a once every three year cycle. Probably could argue that that's not quite frequently, frequently enough that somebody's going in and making sure. Um, and so we are hoping and we are counting on the school, the people running these programs to understand the importance of what they're doing. Um, and to take the own, their own initiative to ensure that what they're serving their students actually is in line with program guidelines. Um, and we need to make sure that at our agency that we're training these professionals so they understand why it is so important. And so we do definitely make sure to do that. And this is something I wanted just to mention too. In the event that you didn't know about the Education Service Centers, this is how Texas Department of Agriculture kind of reaches our um, end users, essentially. We work with the Education Service Centers. They all have a child nutrition professional in the service center that is an expert in our program. So there are 20 regions across the state, and uh, they kind of serve as the local resource for the school districts in that area. So if the schools need training, technical assistance, um, they're you know, monitoring, anything like that, there is somebody in their area that can serve um, as an expert and a great resource for any of you all if you have questions about your actual school district because sometimes these people know a little bit more about what's going on in, your, in that specific area. So uh, just something to know about that we do work with the Education Service Center. And then this was the previous slide. I was just going to point out that all schools do have to have a wellness policy. This is something that's been in place since 2006, I believe, that all schools have had to have a wellness policy. And um, it's just something good to know about. If you didn't know about it, your school does have one. If you're curious um, to how they're using it, you know, you might ask somebody to, to, to pull it out and take a look at it. Certainly, it's covering all of the things. It's, you know, notice the word wellness. It's not just talking about nutrition. It's talking about physical activity as well. Um, it's something. It's designed to get community members involved. People should. The people that are most invested, because they have their kids going to these schools, should have been a part of this. And of course, monitoring is supposed to be a part of it too. So they're supposed to be going back and evaluating how are we doing with our wellness policy. Um, a lot of schools have wellness policies and we're finding aren't necessarily using them so much. So we're really trying to shed some light back on these policies and get people to, to kind of relook at them again and maybe make adjustments that, as needed um, since it's been a while since 06, right? And so this just kind of a, a look at what decisions are made locally. Um, like we said, we've kind of talked a little bit about the national federal guidelines that all schools in the nation, if they're going to be a part of the program, they have to participate or they have to follow the national federal guidelines. Then states have the authority, if they want to, to make their own policies that are no less stringent, right? So if we want to make a tougher policy as a state, we can do that, which we did, and other states have done the same thing as well. Um, and then, of course, schools locally, districts, if they want to, can have uh, more stronger policies if they want to as well. And so that's something just to know about, that if you feel that maybe these policies aren't strong enough, for, or maybe they don't represent what's most important in your district, this is something to kind of start thinking about. You know, you can change what goes on at your school, or you can be involved. Um, 
schools get to decide which menu system that they want to use or menu planning system that they want to use. Um, what actually goes on that menu, it's not like there's a state or a federal menu that is handed down. Schools get, have their own menu planners and they get to determine what they want to put on the menu. And I think we'll probably hear a little bit more about that today too. Um, food preparation methods, uh, price of the meals, charge plans, um, you know, anything that you know, that goes on locally, there actually is quite a bit of control done there. And that's kind of a good thing, right? Because as we talked about, state policies can be a little slow. <laughs> they, don't, they don't necessarily move as quickly as we want them to. And so by the time they get into place, they may not even, you know, reflect what is the current issue going on at your school. Um, and the issues may be different. I mean, I feel like I've heard, depending on who you talk to, some schools are doing you know, wonderful, and they don't need a policy. Other schools maybe need a little bit more encouragement. So it's really good to know that you can and do have the authority to make uh, changes in your local area. So we are also talking a little bit about the Let's Move um, initiative, the First Ladies uh, Let's Move initiative. And this is something that uh, USDA, of course, is behind and, and supporting. And it's multi, you know, multifaceted, the Let's Move uh, initiative is, and they've highlighted many areas that can impact childhood obesity. And um, they're looking at, again, you know, how can families, you know, how can communities, but schools are certainly highlighted as a big piece of how we can reach children. And um, how they say to go about doing that is a couple of ways. Breakfast is a big part of what they're encouraging at school as well as the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. Um, I'm not sure, have you guys heard of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge? I know people that work in child nutrition probably have more than just the general public. But um, this is an initiative. It's voluntary. Schools, what they can do is decide to make um, healthier menus and, and adopt healthier policies. Um, and if they do that, through a, a quite challenging process, they have to document it. And um, once they do it, they can get awarded um, and receive recognition for doing so. And so that is something that we talked about earlier, it's the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, and I do a lot of training on promotion on that. And in Texas, I think we're doing a really good job. But all the schools that receive this award have um, made better menus, they have nutrition education, and they have um, physical education and healthier policies and practices. So it's looking, again, more at that wellness, not just nutrition. Um, the menus have these things on them. Um, they're gonna offer low-fat milk, varieties of fruits and vegetables. There's specifics on dark green and orange vegetables. These are things that probably sound familiar to you. These are the things that the media actually has, you know, picked up and is promoting to whole grains. So every menu that meets uh, the criteria and that gets the awards has these uh, pieces to it. So um, you can see this definitely a healthier school menu than uh, it's, it's exceeding the recommendations right now. Ooh, my slide's off. Well, f until like two weeks ago, we had the most in the nation. If anybody here, by chance, from California, you could call me out. They just beat us. They, had, they submitted for like 400 schools at once. So it's okay. We have a lot of schools in Texas. We will be back on top. I am sure of it. Dora helped us with our big numbers, too. But um, right now we have 405 schools. I think you guys saw the numbers before. We have a lot of schools in Texas, so 405 is not necessarily even the majority of our schools. But um, the process is truly, truly challenging, and this is a, a number that we can certainly be proud of as a state. Our schools all over are doing amazing things. Um, maybe not enough to get the award, um, so, but we, you know, the ones that have gone through through all of the steps, you know, that's, uh, 405 is pretty good. And we get more applications in every day. I'm always so impressed with the school districts that are stepping up to do this because it really is a commitment by the staff. And you saw the requirements go beyond just the child nutrition too. I mean, they, you have to have principals that are willing to enforce other policies and practices and make sure that physical activity is there. And it's really kind of a collaborative e effort at that campus. So the fact that we got this many, you know, to come on board and take on the challenge, especially right now. I mean, I think we all know how tight everything is in districts. There are a lot of people asking schools to do a lot of things. The fact that they would take this on is, is very impressive. Um, so we're encouraging schools to please continue to try to do this. Um, and we're you know, talking about it out here too, so you can maybe go back to your school and 
you know, maybe just start the dialogue there. I mean, um, even w doing one component of this would be really good. But um, if they could go all the way and do the take on the whole challenge, that would be even better. So if you want to see what schools have won, again, on our squaremeals.org website, you can see. And we have a list of all of our Texas winners. And then also USDA has them up on their team nutrition website. And I have the links at the end of the slides, so they're probably in your packets if you're interested. So Nutrigram, this is something um, that Texas has partnered with the Cooper Institute to do um, as more of a it's, a, it's an education component. We've talked a lot about how, um, you know, the importance of it, how that can really impact what students take, you know, take home to their parents and what, how they select whenever they're on the school lunch line, maybe when they're out doing all the fast food. You know, having that education is really, really, really important to helping them connect the dots and, you know, be empowered to do what we want them to do. Um, and so just like Fitness Gram, if you guys are familiar with that, this is the kind of the nutrition component or piece of that. What it does is it's, uh, they take surveys and they're measured and then the kids are given um, a report card basically telling them how they did and, and gives parents and teachers and administrators, you know, an idea of what exactly is going on um, nutrition wise with their students. So we have a video that kind of says that way better than I did um, that we can show you. Childhood obesity is a serious problem that we need to deal with in the United States. We've gone from only 8% of our children who are weight obese from 6 to 19 years of age back in the 1960s to almost 40% of the present time. I know the story of a 17-year-old boy in Missouri with very early onset obesity, early onset type 2 diabetes, who's had a triple coronary bypass already. This generation will not live as long as the last generation, that parents are going to see their children die before they die. This is what lies ahead if we don't change our current trajectories. It is past time to put a stop to this. Nutrigram is a simple interactive survey that provides educators, parents, and students with valuable information about students' nutrition knowledge and behaviors. If you want to have a lifestyle changing program, first of all, very critical is an evaluation. Find out what your problem is. A tool like Nutrivan can tell us, the research community, the school itself, the parents, how the kids in the school are doing today. Are they eating well? Do they have the critical nutrition knowledge they need to make good choices? A lot of these fruits and vegetables uh, are not familiar to the students. Sometimes, you know, they haven't seen an eggplant. Sometimes they don't know what it is. A lot of kids think that drinking an orange soda is a nutritious drink because it has an orange on the soda can. As soon as the Nutrigram survey is taken, teachers get an immediate and customized profile for each student. <laughs> One of the things that I like about Nutrigram is that it is quick and easy and it allows me to be able to see where my students are and what they know and what they don't know right away. And from there I can tailor their um, lessons to increase their knowledge. 
to learn and um, educate themselves. The second component of Nutrigram is the fun and educational website where students can learn about nutrition and healthy foods in a video game that inspires learning. The thing about Nutrigram is that it was definitely kid friendly. Um, the kids loved going into the game. The graphics were awesome. They were colorful. They loved learning more about what was healthier for them and what was not so healthy. There is also an area in Nutrigram for parents to go in with their own password and they can find out exactly how their kids did on their surveys. They can go in and see how they can have healthier lifestyles at home. Teachers can go in and see how their students can increase their nutrition knowledge by tailoring lessons for the classroom. is to be a great bridge between school and home and help build awareness at home. Children are children. They don't get to go to the grocery store and buy the products. They don't get to uh, drive the car and go to the fast food restaurants. They are given what their parents give to them. So if we can educate the parents to make better choices, then our students will make better choices as well. children learn better, healthy children behave better, and healthy children are healthier children. Those are three things that we all ought to be really, really in support of. Nutrigram can get us there. Education is the first step to living a healthy life. Improving students' nutritional knowledge empowers them to make better decisions, live healthier lives, and be better students. Healthier students. And so I have some brochures that we can, you guys can get more information about at the table at the end of the day too. And of course, like we talked about, if you have questions specifically about that, um, we can talk about it a little bit more, um, I think immediately after this. And really what it is, it's just an, an education, uh, it's a free education service that our schools in Texas um, can use and will be available to them. The target audience for this project product right now is third to fifth graders. So that's really what the surveys are designed for um, and who they're designed for. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and like it, it talked about, there's three components. There's surveys that the kids, the kiddos go online and they answer some questions. It's, you know, not a 24 hour diet recall or anything like that, but it just tries to get some attitude. Like what do they think is healthier? Um, are they able, or do they? We ask them, you know, when you're on the line, do you select healthier things or less healthier things? And just kind of gives you a snapshot of what the kids are doing. Um, from, we can extrapolate data from a high, high level, but um, the, stu the teachers and administrators at the school will actually be able to go in at the student level and see how these students are answering. Um, and teachers will be able to say, oh, look, my class in particular doesn't know anything about X. And then, that, then they're able to work that into whatever lesson that they're teaching. It doesn't have to be, you know, only in health class. We've uh, put on the, on the resource list on the website, um, you know, lesson plans that are in line with the, the TEKS and everything that they can somehow work in, you know, nutrition into math or nutrition into social studies or whatever the subject may be. And it's already there and available for them. Um, and it just, hopefully it'll, you know, the idea is that it's just going to start a conversation. I don't think that anybody thinks that it's going to solve the problem of obesity, you know, in one fell swoop. But it's certainly, uh, we think, a great op uh, resource for schools to have. And the fact that it's going to be available at no cost, we're hoping will incent student, or the teachers to maybe pick it up and try it um, at least, you know, to learn and kind of touch base with what's going on with their students. And then, of course, a big component, which we think will be the most enticing for the students, is the game. Um, and the game is called Quest to Lava Mountain. 
and um, we have a little clip, a little trailer for you all to see about that too. Um, and the idea is, we know kids are doing video games, they like video games, we're kind of meeting them where they're at um, and giving them an opportunity to do something fun where the, and that they're learning, but maybe not noticing that they're learning. I don't know, we'll see um, how, how it works out. Uh, we've just begun, we've done some pilot testing and it seems that the kids really like it. Um, and so we're hoping that they're learning along <laughs> with just playing. Um, but you can go ahead and play it, yeah. Something is terribly wrong in the world You can see it's very dangerous and spooky. <laughs> no bugs are harmed in the video. There, it's usually like smoking the bees and they're stunned for a minute, or you know, clubbing a rock, and then somehow I don't know. It's very, it was very, very well thought out. But um, the idea is, as you can see, as they go through, they're collecting all different types of foods, and they kind of put them into their bank, for lack of a better word. And then as their energy starts to deplete, they go in, and then at that point, they decide, okay, what am I going to eat to make to rebuild my energy? And the healthier foods give them more strength than the less healthier foods. We kind of did it with the go slow, whoa. Um, type, we did the red, yellow, green, and tried to follow the same curriculum. So the idea isn't to reinvent the wheel, to tell students more confusing information. As we know, nutrition can sometimes be a little confusing. And we tried to keep it simple and in line with what they're used to hearing, um, but just kind of fun, you know, where they can go and, and, you know, make that connection of, oh, if I eat healthy, I'll actually do better than if I eat unhealthfully. So, um, very interesting, we think, and fun. And um, if you go to Nutrigram.org website, you can, these videos are up there if you want to watch them again. But um, it's also if you wanted to show other people in your school district what's going on. And um, if you want to sign up, that's how you do it too. So we're really hoping that the word will spread and that uh, we get lots of schools to sign up. Uh, there should be a, a press release uh, next week. So hopefully, again, you'll hear a little bit more about this. Um, but we're pretty excited. So that's Nutrigram. Oh, I'm in charge from this point. I like Scott being in charge over there. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of the, you know, where school nutrition is going. Um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, December of last year, is that right? That, that was signed in. Um, this is not, it's a big thing um, that's going to have a huge impact on child nutrition as a whole, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, it's going to impact not only the National School Lunch Program and those reimbursable meals that we spent so much time talking about, but now also it's going to be looking at competitive foods. USDA now does have the authority to um, regulate what is going on um, all throughout the campus, not just on that reimbursable line. So we should see some changes uh, coming up with that. Um, rate increases, something that hasn't happened in a really long time, the amount of um, money that the schools get for each reimbursable meal is changing. Slightly, it's not an enormous amount of money, six cents. I don't know if anybody knows about the cost of running a program. It's not probably going to be enough, but it certainly is something, and that's uh, very exciting. Um, like we talked about before with the wellness policies, uh, just kind of a, you know, re emergence of people <laughs> looking at the wellness policies and asking, you know, what are schools doing with this? Because we see it as a very important way for schools to um, start analyzing and assessing what they're doing for their students' um, health and wellness. Farm to School is promoted. There's just a whole lot that goes on with this act. Um, if you go to, uh, is it whitehouse.gov? I believe their website has um, lots of 
fact sheets and tip sheets that give you good snapshots that, you know, one pagers that can kind of let you know what all is part of that. Um, if you're involved at all with school nutrition or in interested at all in school nutrition, I strongly encourage you to look and learn um, a little bit more about that because it is uh, important to know. Um, the proposed rule came out. Um, what uh, This is something that isn't made final yet. We just keep saying that over and over again. So everything that I'm talking about, this is still in the proposed stage. But this is what came out from um, USDA. So uh, what USDA did is they recognized that the child nutrition program nutrition uh, standards needed to be revamped. We needed to do something different to make the meals more healthy. So they went to the Institute of Medicine and they asked them to do uh, a report and kind of analyze, you know, with everything that has to go on with child nutrition, how can we make this, how can we make the meals more healthful but have it still be something that can be done by schools. Um, and so they did and they came out with the report and then based on that report, USDA put out this proposed rule. So um, definitely very science-based report. Um, but the proposed rule uh, has, you know, lots of different changes uh, that are going to be new requirements for schools and child nutrition program. Um, a lot of it is not going to be shocking, I don't think, to anybody. I mean, it's promoting the foods that I think we hear over and over and over again. Fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, lean meats, proteins, uh, lower fat dairy. These are all parts of the proposed rule. And um, I've kind of, I made a little table so you all can see kind of the before and after of what the, the nutrition standards are. But in general, this is what it's saying. Um, reduce sat saturated fat and sodium. I mean, have we heard about the importance of reducing sodium? That's certainly something that's gotten a lot of media attention. Um, particularly if, you've, if you know much about school meals, that is something that has gotten a lot of attention. There can be very high in sodium. Um, in part because of the processed uh, nature of the foods that usually increases the sodium. Um, so it could be a big challenge for schools though too because there's, you know, processing has, you know, good and bad to it. There's a reason in that it helps with, you know, a lot of times food sanitation, you know, or food safety. Uh, if they're not, if your food is not being handled from a raw state, it doesn't, you don't have to worry so much about it. Um, it's also quicker. Uh, school districts are huge now. They have to put out a ton of meals in a very short period of time. And, you know, the less food preparation that has to go involved allows schools to be able to handle that. Um, so there's going to be a lot that has to go into getting the meals made more from scratch and, and lower in sodium. And I, that may be something that our uh, child nutrition folks are going to talk about today. But um, it's certainly something that is part of the proposed rule, and I think we'll see a big focus moving forward is how we can reduce sodium in school meals. Um, there's minimum and maximum calorie levels that are uh, per, as part of the proposed rule. Currently, they have to just meet a minimum standard. Um, they can also, now it's going to be that they're set in between that they can't go too high or too low, I guess, with the nutrition standards. So. Um, as these widen, as the kiddos, you know, the younger kiddos are going to have a smaller, they're going to need fewer calories, right, like as you would assume, and then the older, bigger kiddos, they're going to be allowed to have a little bit more. So it's not like anybody's going to be starving or anything. I believe it's still what, up to 800 calories for lunch, so still quite a lot of food. But, you know, a, a high school boy that's playing sports needs that amount of nutrition. So, I mean, I think that... Uh, they make sense and the Institute of Medicine did was very thoughtful about their recommendations. So um, again, proposed, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen before this is final, but just kind of gets you um, an idea of what they say. Oh, something else worth mentioning is meals as selected by students. That's referring to the offer versus serve that I talked about earlier, how students don't have to take everything. What they're doing now in the proposed rule is that students would have to take a fruit or a vegetable with, on the line as they go through. Um, so you can see that sounds really good. Hopefully that, you know, we want a big piece of this is going to be educating on students as to why they need to do that and getting them to actually consume it because we can get them to put it on the tray, but they may or may not, they may take one bite and ditch it, you know, or none at all. And that, that doesn't really help us. So we really are hoping to, um, continue to, with this education component, get kids to understand why this matters and why they need to take it. And Assessment is a big part of this proposed rule too. Whatever goes in place, they're really encouraging schools to measure and states to measure whether or not this is effective and achieving the ultimate goal, which is to get our children to eat healthier meals. 
so this is just a snapshot of the breakfast requirement. So if you look on the left, I don't know if this is too small to read. Most of y'all are in the very back. But uh, on the left-hand side, you can see where it's currently at and then the new recommendation on the right. So you can see uh, portion sizes, fruits increase uh, pretty significantly. Um, when you, I guess you can read going down to... You are the only participants in this conference. No, I'm not. Well, thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of us here. I don't know who that was, but she does not know. I think we're on a webinar. Well, I think. thank you to continue this conference. <laughs> Anyways, so that's breakfast. So you guys can see that they're, um, uh, you know, again, right in line with what we were talking about before. More fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains. That's what we're, that's what we're going for. And then for lunch, this shouldn't be shocking. It looks pretty similar as far as the requirement. It's got, there it goes. And currently the way that it's set up, the fruit and vegetables are combined whenever they're doing menu planning. So now this is gonna be something that is separated out. You know, means more or less to probably some of you in the room, but um, it's something that is definitely very different. Um, and again, uh, you can just see the portion sizes go up of the foods that we are promoting, the fruits, vegetables, whole grains. Um, and then uh, fat content in milk is actually addressed too, so lower fat milk. And then again, like we talked about also, sodium levels, um, there's still gonna be, uh, they'll still have to meet some nutrition standards, but it's gonna look a little bit different instead of having the meal you know, analyzed on all components. They're really just gonna be looking at sodium, <laughs> saturated fat, trans fat, um, calories. And um, the idea is that if the school meals have all of these components that as required by the meal pattern, they will be meeting all of the, the nutrition standards that we're hoping for, such the vitamins and minerals that um, were previously assessed. So it won't be necessary to do all the analysis because we're gonna know that if they're getting whole greens, dark green and orange uh, vegetables, fresh fruits, they're getting what they need. So um, it'll only be necessary to analyze for things like the fat, sodium, and um, calories. So it's a big change for those of us in child nutrition um, and we're hoping that um, the end result is really truly healthier meals for the students. Um, changes that took place this year that you may have already heard about um, that were in part of this this act um, the milk now you have to see the schools have to offer low fat milk I think in Texas well with our Texas public school nutrition policy that was already in place they already had lower fat milk but and I want to say you know just going out and talking to schools most schools already are moving to mostly skim milk maybe one percent milk so um, I feel like it, certainly in Texas that's something that we're kind of ahead of the curve on um, potable water students have to have access to water in school. Um, I don't know, previously that wasn't something that they had to have, so now they do have to have, to have water available. Um, and a big thing for us, or I'm very curious to see what this looks like, is the proposed rule for competitive foods. So competitive foods are just those a la carte um, items such you know, as what might be in a vending machine or something like that they're gonna actually put out a rule that sets guidelines on what those foods can be. So think, start thinking uh, like granola bars, chips, um, fruit drinks, stuff like that, that is in schools, like, you know, uh, probably on some lines, some in vending machines. Um, you're gonna see a proposed rule come out on what those should be, what that should look like. And I think in December is when I heard that that was gonna come out. When proposed rules come out, the public has an opportunity to comment on it. If you're at all invested in this, I really strongly encourage you to pay attention to that and write in. You know, if you think that it looks the way that it should, great. If you think that it should look slightly different, put in your suggestions. USDA will look at every single comment that comes in. And, um, you know, if you, you are the ones that are going to help to shape this policy um, that comes out ultimately. So please, please pay attention to it. Um, I, geez, USDA's website, I assume would have the information on it. Um, if you wanna know more about that too, we can talk about it afterward. Getting involved, I think we've talked a little bit about all the stuff that can be, all the decisions that are able to be made at a local level. So um, these are ways that you can kind of get involved at your local area. I think it's really important to, to know your child nutrition director. These folks are the ones that are making 
decisions on the ground level, and they're going to know exactly what's going on with your ch your meals in your school. So I think it's very, very important to know that person. Um, be familiar with your the policies that are going on in your school. All the time I hear from parents that are either upset or happy <laughs> about what's going on at their school. And, you know, a lot of times it has nothing to do with the state level policy. It's what's going on at the local level. So um, before you, you know, do anything, find out what's going on, what has to be and what doesn't have to be in your school district. Um, of course, any parent-teacher organization, your shacks, um, these are um, great vehicles to get your ideas heard. If you're passionate about this and you want to, you know, get involved, that's a great place to get together with like-minded people, and those are how policies get shaped. So it's really important to get involved. Um, of course, I'm going to promote the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, uh, you know, something that I hope that all school districts won't decide to go for. Um, Texas Action for Healthy Kids, obviously, uh, a great organization that um, can be a wonderful uh, place to get resources and to get involved and get connected. Um, Nutrigram, you know, check out that website if you, uh, I don't know, it is for elementary schools right now, like I said before, third through fifth grade students. So that is kind of a niche population um, and we're hoping for it to be able to be expanded in the future. But if that is an area that you're interested in um, or that's a grade group that you're working with, definitely check that out. And then of course, proposed rule. Anytime that um, the proposed rule comes out, get in there, write your comments, your concerns, your questions, um, let it be known. And um, to, to, that could be one way you get involved and be a part. So here um, are some websites. Again, these are on your handout, so you don't need to write anything down. But just more places for you to go to get information. And the squaremeals.org is going to be your Texas uh, USDA website. So anything that you want to, want to know about going on in Texas, go there. So that's going to be your, your nutrition policy. There's actually tons of information about uh, part, you know, the meal planning systems. Anything you ever wanted to know about is on our website. So definitely um, go there for that. And then resources too. Um, nutrition education resources. A lot of stuff that you can print will be there. Um, and then, of course, I'm getting the Choose My Plate, which we talked about before, too. And that's just a good general resource for healthy nutrition information, so I wanted to put it up there. But otherwise, I think that is all I have for contact information for us. And otherwise, I think that's it. And I think you wanted to do maybe... Yes. Oh. Yes, um, yeah, thank you, Paige. Again, it always, whenever I watch your presentation, it blows my mind how, you, how much you know because that agency has so much information and she's able to translate it to us in such a very clear way.